You know the feeling when your mate's golf ball flies past yours? Or when you're on the green in regulation, but he holds it from the bunker? At Drummond Golf, we get it. That's why we have our lowest price guarantee. As Australia's biggest, you can count on our massive buying power for the lowest prices in golf. But if you do happen to find a lower advertised price, we'll beat it. The Drummond Golf lowest price guarantee. Unbeatable. Conditions apply. Hello and welcome to episode 84 of The Thing About Golf, Golf Australia Magazine's ongoing exploration of the myriad reasons people get hooked on this, the greatest stick and ball game of them all. My name's Rod Murray and on this episode we're exploring the world of golf course architecture, but from a perspective most of us rarely get. Christine Fraser is a Canadian golf course architect and one of the few women making her way in the course design business. But that's not all that makes Christine stand out. Yes, she understands strategic and penal golf and all the other things us architecture geeks like to go on about, but there's much, much more to the way Christine thinks about the game. In her mind, golf has the potential to be the most inclusive sport of all and, done right, add greatly to every community it's a part of. Yes, she brings a woman's perspective to the craft, but more than that, she brings an intelligence and big picture thinking about what golf can and should be. It's a discussion that went in directions I wasn't expecting, and it bears the most important hallmark of a good conversation. It made me think, and I hope it does the same for you too. Well, Christine Fraser, it's extraordinarily generous of you to take some time to chat to us. You are, in fact, very busy these days, which is wonderful, and we'll come to that. Our jumping off point is the thing about golf. What's the thing about golf for Christine Fraser? The thing about golf is that um, it has some issues. And I think if we can mitigate or alleviate or, in fact, eliminate those issues, golf could be the best sport, best game in the world. Sure. And and we could also make Santa real and then it'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? Come on, Christine. Are these things possible? We'll talk about that as we go along. You're a golf course architect, Christine. Almost nobody, I imagine, when they're asked at the age of six or seven what they'd like to do, says, I'd like to design golf courses. How did that become your life? I, in fact, do have a few drawings from when I was six or seven. About <laughs> a, little, a little routing I have in my backyard of how I would set it up with a little par three hole and a playground and a swimming pool and a trampoline. Um, but when I, got re- when I started to become really serious about getting into architecture, I was in um, university mm-hmm. In my undergrad, playing golf down in Florida. You're a golfer. Com- so we must make the point. You're, you're a golfer, a good golfer. And I guess uh, that thing about uh, golf <laughs> question was about that partly as well, but just so that people know, yes. Yeah, I, w- I was a fairly um, good golfer and I played Division One down in Florida. And um, during that experience, I was able to travel around and play all different types of golf courses that I had never experienced outside of Canada before. So it was, you know, the bluegrass of, of Florida golf courses um, and the Bermudas of the Florida golf courses. And then you get to Tennessee and it's mountain golf. Then you go to North Carolina and it's sand um, and acidic ground. And I had never experienced any of those types of golf courses before. And that's when I really started to think about what goes into designing and building and a golf course. So that was my initial my initial thought. Now, you well know, Christine, probably now better than even then, there's two types of golfers. There's golfers who notice that stuff like you did, and there's golfers who just don't. What do you think the difference is? Where does that come from? I, I don't know. That's a really interesting question because I I, I often push people on that as well and, and try to get curious about why they like a golf hole or why they don't like a golf hole. And and a lot of the time the answer is, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. I just know that I like it. And I find this a really interesting exercise in trying to pick people's brains about the experience they have on a golf course. Um, and I and I still don't know the answer to that question, but I, I'd like to think that people can trans, transfer from one of those to the other. I think I think you're right. I think it's a matter of being peaked in the right way. Most people with an interest like you and I in golf course architecture have had a light bulb moment somewhere. Mine was in Scotland, mm. and in particular St Andrews. This is like nothing we'd ever seen in Australia. It was like, wow, this really sparked some things. Did you have a light bulb moment? 
Yeah, I did. I can I can remember it very vividly. I was reading a magazine in at a golf course and they did this feature on um a golf course that used to be a quarry that was turned into a US open venue. Um and it, it was Chambers Bay. Chambers Bay. And that was my light bulb moment of like, oh my God, this is the most incredible thing I've ever heard. How do I do that? That's what I want to do with the rest of my life. Within golf, Christine people like you and I are often seen as a subset and not uncommon to be called snobs, intellectualising over I feel the opposite. I feel like the gift of having an interest in architecture makes the game so much richer. How do we share that without putting people off? We've not done a good job of it so far, have we? <laughs> no, no, we haven't. Um, but I think it goes back to a little bit what we were talking to about before about just asking people about their experience on the golf course and trying to figure out what they like and what they don't like about their experience without getting into any of the technicalities or design templates or strategic ideas, anything like that. Just asking, why do you like a golf hole? Mm. To me, golf's a very cerebral pursuit, far more so than physical. I mean, the physical's only a part of it. It's the, it's the mind that can make the game so much more. A lot of people don't see it that way, do they? they, they uh, we had you on our Good Good podcast some time ago, and my co-host Adrian Logue, who you met, obviously, and we had a really good chat, he talks about, he formed this theory one time on the podcast about look-downers and look-uppers. Look-downers are only interested in how many yards their six iron goes and what their score is on the day. And look-uppers look around and go, this is an amazing place to play. Yeah, and that, that's you. It's, it's Adrian spot on. And I often find there's, um, not to gender it, but there's often a different response based on gender. And a lot of the times the when I ask girls or women um, what they liked about a golf hole, they they will come back to you know the, the an oak tree that was in full fall colors, or an otter that they saw in the pond, mm -hmm. or a conversation that they were able to have with their sister. Whereas men are like you know it's the hardest it. hole in the course. <laughs> I made and birdie. I, and I birdied it. I, yeah, <laughs> I beat it because I'm a man. Yeah, we'll talk about gender because well, I was in two minds about talking about gender with you today because I went and sort of did a bit of research and hunting around. Every story I read is man bites dog. Christine Fraser's a woman and a golf course architect. Mm, mm. Maybe one day we'll get to the Nirvana where that just doesn't matter, but it is a thing, isn't it? There's real – and golf seems to, to have more of this gender stuff in all facets, including in the business that you're in, more of this gender stuff than perhaps the rest of society. Golf as a culture is moving more slowly, isn't it? Yeah, and, and golf has a lot to reckon with when it comes to gender and gendering and marginalizing people based on their gender. And so I think that's why the conversation is so at the forefront in golf right now, because it is trying to cut up, catch up to the rest of society and some of it is, and, and evolving. It's, some of it is. Some of yeah, it is. A lot of it, of it is, it. is very <laughs> staunch about not even recognizing that there is a gender disparity and issue in golf. Hmm. Where do you see it? But not not just in your professional life with um, being a course architect, but as a as a lifelong golfer and a woman, a female. What's different f about your golf experience from mine? I, I, it's from the moment I step onto a property. I'm I'm pointed to the to the ladies' tees, to the red tees, and I'm told by the starter, "Do I know how to operate the the golf cart?" Um, or it, it just the assumptions are there um, from the moment you step onto the golf course and you look down at the scorecard and, and there's a ladies tease and there's a men's tease. And, and so there are, there are a lot of different forces that are at play here from language to facilities to then to the architecture on the golf course. There's a huge disparity in, and the way that the golf course is laid out from people playing the quote-unquote ladies' tees versus the men's tees. Lots of people will tell you, Christine, that that's some sort of an overreaction. Why shouldn't they be called ladies' tees? Why shouldn't we have ladies' tees? Why does it matter? Why are you upset about that? Why are you being woke and ranting about that like a lefty? Um, I wish Adrian was here so that he could <laughs> comment on his shard-sipping lefty tendencies. Um, but but I don't think it's an overreaction. I think it's an opportunity for golf to expand its clientele and for for golf to to evolve and invite more people to the game and consider that 
women and girls are just as valuable as customers as men. Um, so I see it as an opportunity for the whole industry to to just become better and and contribute to its own sustainability. Of all the sports and recreational pursuits, golf probably more than others is much more. It's certainly a game that men and women can play together. Most can't. And it's unique in that way. It's a game that can be shared. And yet we just don't exploit that, do we? Either from a business or from a social aspect. No, that's right. You, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if we – I don't know if you've ever seen the experiment. This is always about racism and sexism. All the isms come under this experiment. The blue eyes, brown eyes idea. Have you seen that from the 70s? Uh, they yeah, just separate yeah. people into blue eyes and brown eyes. I wonder if we took a lot of those people who'd say that it doesn't matter if they're called ladies, tees, or whatever they are, and started assigning them tees based on their eye colour, what their right. response might be. <laughs> when it happens to you, it's different, isn't it? It's never happened to me. But it's happened to you clearly mm-hmm. a lot, and so it's hard for me to understand that. Yeah, and it's it's not great a, a great feeling to um, to feel like you haven't been considered, or to feel like you're less welcome than someone else based on their eye color or on their gender. And and that's really what golf needs to work on is is becoming more accessible, becoming more welcoming, um, trying to change people's minds about. You know the value in golf, especially from from an outsider's perspective. People who who don't play golf or have mm-hmm. never played golf or have their own assumptions about golf. We'll come to some of that shortly, Christine. You pushed through. Lots of women do. I can only imagine lots more don't. Yeah, because of so many factors. Because um, because it's too difficult. Because their first experience on the golf course, they were discriminated against, or they didn't feel welcome, mm-hmm. or. Um, you know, there's just more desirable things out there for women uh, in 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 basketball and hockey and whatever it might be. Yeah, it's uh, it's like the dog park, isn't it, Christine? It's not the dogs that are the problem; it's the people. It's not golf that's the problem; it's the people. <laughs> it's the same kind of right. fellas. Be better <laughs> if you're a bloke and you're not being welcoming. Be better. Do better at it because it's better for all of us. Let's talk about some of the good stuff about golf. We can get bogged down in what's not great about golf, and there's lots of it. And golf's going to pay a price for that. For, with people from outside, and we'll talk about that too. Let's talk about the good stuff of golf, though. So I read through the list of courses where you've worked. You started in this business uh, with Martin Hawtrey, and you've mm-hmm. talked lots of times about what a, an important mentor he's been for you. Talk more broadly about the importance of mentors, particularly in an area like golf course architecture where there's no textbooks, there's no black and white, right and wrong, there's no binary notions about this is good, this is bad. I imagine Martin's been important to you in lots more ways than just from a golf perspective, but talk a little bit about that golf and golf course architecture and what an extraordinary thing it is to do. Yeah, it's a subjective art form. So uh, ask any um, anyone who's in the arts, you know, what their pursuit of perfection looks like, and it's different for every person you ask. And um, what Martin really taught me is that this this form of art is is so intuitive and as you said, there's there's not one way to go about things and there's not one right answer. So you have to really trust your gut and trust your experience. And so to have a mentor like Martin Hawtrey, who's in my corner, has my back, encourages me to take risks, that was instrumental in in my development of of my design theories and philosophies. It's quite a responsibility too, Christine. You can see golf courses from aeroplanes. Most art, if it's no good, you just go over it and start again. You don't have that luxury with a golf course, do you? Do you feel that responsibility? If you thought about that way, well, you might not do it, I guess, but do you feel that responsibility? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, the, I, it's really hard to justify having a golf course in a lot of places, in my opinion. And um, if we're just playing it for a sport, um, then then maybe that's it's not worth it. But if there's value in what it can bring to the community or how it can help a person's mental health or physical health. And then those kind of social impact offerings make a golf course more valuable and more worthy of the land usage, the water usage, et cetera. All of which is important in something that we discuss regularly on our sort of good, good podcast and regularly in the pages of the magazine here, this, this notion that from outside of golf, golf's coming under increasing pressure in urban areas in particular, and it's understandable. Mm-hmm. When places grow, people need places to live. They don't play golf. They look at the golf course and go, hey, we could live there, or even better, we just turn it into a park so everybody can use it. You must come across these discussions a lot. 
How do we go about uh, making people who don't play golf understand the importance of golf to those who play it, particularly if those people have been kind of rejected or excluded by the game in the past? (laughs) Makes the task more difficult, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And Toronto is experiencing that uh, as a lot of other municipalities in Canada have of coming up against people who think that a golf course would be better served as a housing development or a shopping mall or, or whatever it may or be. Or anything, Christine, for some people. Anything but a golf course. Anything but a golf course, exactly. Um, and it's a really daunting process for those of us who care about municipal golf to try to convince non-golfers that there is value in in, in what we're trying to do. And um, I think what it comes down to is, is access and allowing people to have access to the golf course to use it in however they see fit, um, whether that's – in the winter on cross-country skis or having a trail system that goes through the park or even the notion that um, the revenues from the golf course can help subsidize other other social endeavors such as park systems that you know do nothing but cost money to Mm. the municipalities whose job is that christine to do that it's an unfair (laughs) it's an unfair question i know but whose job is that who should be doing that I mean, I, I feel pressure to do that. I'm, I do. I feel like architectures, architects need to, need to take some of that burden, not just the municipalities, not just people who are invested locally. Um, I think about that a lot. What role can you play as an architect? Is it simply about designing golf holes that are more accessible for more people, or is there more to it than that? I think that's where it starts. That's a really great place to start of considering accessible architecture. Um, but what do we mean by the tease that out? Accessible architecture is it as simple as the seventeenth at TPC Sawgrass is not accessible architecture, and the twelfth hole at the old course is? Is it that kind of idea? Perhaps, uh, it, yes. I think if you really want to simplify, it, yes. Um, it's also uh, looking at environmental justice of allowing people in the community to have access to green spaces and making sure that the water that enters the golf course is cleaner when it leaves the golf course to serve better serve the the community in that way um and then the environment in that way um but accessible architecture that's that's really just the start i think you also have to consider the language you're using on the scorecard the way that you're inviting you know marginalized groups into the center including the queer community, the the adaptive needs community, the indigenous and BIPOC communities, and and really, you know, giving them this golf course to use as they see fit to come as they are. For golf, Christine? Or does golf no. need to be more than just golf? No, not just for golf. That's not enough. Golf is not enough on its own. Golfers are horrified by that notion. You know that, don't you? Golfers feel a sense of ownership over public golf courses. This is our golf course where we've always yeah. played. Why are you thinking you can have it? How do we learn to yeah. share? Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a really interesting notion that the people that are saying that, you know, they're never going to leave. That's not your target market anymore. Um, those are golfers for life, and and you know, there's those are not the people that you should be investing your time and money into getting to know and, and trying to make a facility to suit them. That's a, that's, a, that's a notion that I think we can let go. What happens if we don't make these changes? Uh, access to golf and, and what golf can provide to a community will fail. We will, golf courses will continue to close mm. and participation rates will drop because we know that municipal golf is the easiest entry into the sport um, and it'll, it'll be pretty bleak. Because when golf disappears, it never comes back, does it? I don't know of any case where a golf course has closed, a public facility, and then reopened some years later. It just doesn't happen. Once it's closed, it's gone. They will be gone forever. And then there's no opportunity. What ways have you seen and what ways do you think we can be better at that in how we go about the business of golf, particularly public golf. Uh, this is, this, uh, you can't tell private golf clubs what to do. You would hope that lots of private golf clubs would see the value in be, being more inclusive and diverse, but in that public space, how do we do that? So as an architect, let's say, for example, a public municipal course called on you to 
do a bit of a redesign, restoration, whatever it might be. What sorts of suggestions mm. are you making that can help in that space beyond just, well, this should be a par three and we'll split this par five into a par four and a par three and some of those mechanical golf aspects? How can you help as an architect? Yeah, I think um, asking for help and consulting with the community and bringing in lead- community leaders and religious leaders and people from the adaptive of needs community and and asking them how they want to use the golf course and want to use the property and and um, really consider what they need um and and making sure that we we understand the connection between sustainability and participation rates and affordability so um, we really need to consider the way that we use our water consumption um, so that the cost of that water which is inevitably going to increase, doesn't trickle down to the consumer and increase the cost of golf and and undo all of the work that has Mm. been done in the past decade. I have a podcast studio here in Sydney. One of the podcasts that gets produced here is for a place called the Centre for Inclusive Design. And I mention that because it comes right to this point. Their podcast is called With Not For, and it's about how the world is designed. And so often, we design for a purpose, don't we? not with people in mind. I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Ask. The that's people. a more concise way of what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I think you made a really good point. But it's something that we don't. It's, it's not. The, it's not traditionally the way that relationship would work, is it? A designer would generally come in and say, "Here is the land. Here are the holes I've designed, and lay them out." It doesn't sort of go beyond that, doesn't it? There's not necessarily great thought for the end user beyond that end user being a golfer. Right. And that's a great way to invite the community in and, mm-hmm. and really begin to have a stake in this endeavor and, and, and allow them to become invested and have some autonomy and accountability in the end product. Yeah. Have you seen that work anywhere? Has, have you seen that in action where that's been effective, where people have actually worked at doing that and it's been it's been yes. successful. So um, I was at uh, the um, National Links Trust Symposium for Municipal mm. Golf last week. It was in DC, and I um, I was I was fortunate enough to meet Tanel Bolt, and she's in a she's an adaptive needs golfer, and um, they have a municipal golf course in Minnesota. It's called Chaska, and they've completely um, renovated it. It's it went from sort of a championship mm-hmm. par three course into a really accessible and interesting design golf course. Um, and Ben Warren was involved in that. And and I, it's not open yet, but the way that they were talking about it during the symposium and Tanel's involvement um, to really make sure that the, the architecture that was designed would actually function for a paragolfer or someone on a solo rider or anyone with visibility or mobility needs. Uh, so I think that's, that's such an interesting concept, and I, and I imagine it's going to be a huge success. There's a real crossover here, isn't there? Those two things bump up against each other. If you think there is no, there would be nothing stopping somebody in a paragolf of playing at St Andrews or Royal Melbourne. Both of those right. courses would lend themselves perfectly to that that start that 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 functionality, and yeah. they're two of the best courses in the world. And I don't want to pick on it, although I kind of do. That's not true of TPC Sawgrass, is it? And so you could you could make the case that in fact that architecture that's more inclusive for more golfers is in fact better architecture for all golfers. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I find I think it f- provides more interesting golf, more technical golf because you have to have a range of skills, not just you know your seven iron in the air and the lands in the middle of the green. Um, it it it's conducive to more sustainable design in terms of allowing the fairways to firm and brown. When it's needed, uh, there's so many benefits to this. And when we talk about designing for people with adaptive needs, it doesn't mean that we're, you know, flattening a golf course. That it, it's still interesting. It's still fun. It's still challenging as it needs to be. It's just we consider these people a little bit more than we have in the past. Mm. That creates something that can be used both ways. And look, if you genuinely love golf, you wouldn't want to deny anybody the opportunity to enjoy it. I don't think uh, that that's tend to be my experience. There, there's a word we've sort of lost from golf. It's not fun, although that you could make the case. <laughs> that is what we've replaced it with another F word. But you read writings from many years ago and you see the word sporty in relation to golf courses. 
I feel like we've lost a lot of sporty from golf over the years, but we might be starting to get it back. Are you seeing a shift? Lots of people talking about this second uh, second golden age of golf design, you know, the Cores and Crenshaws, the Mike Claytons, yourself, Jeff Mingo, who you work with, um, Ian Andrew over there in Canada, this sort of movement of golf design, Tom Doak, that's a lot different to some perhaps what we saw in the 80s and 90s. Do you see that? And What's the future of that? What, what's going to happen with golf course design? So what do you mean, Rod, by it's more sporty? So sporty, if I think of, think of a course perhaps that we both know, probably an island somewhere. Um, I would think of La Hinch as a sporty golf course. There's challenges and it's rugged, it's wild, it's exciting. It gets the blood pumping. A lot of the tee shots make you sort of, you almost have a physiological reaction Mm-hmm. different to the physiological reaction you have on the 17th at Sawgrass where it's sort of just fear. Does that make sense? Is I think it- I understand. You're just saying it's the 17th at Sawgrass, there's one shot and you have yes, to hit it perfectly. Yes, of course. Whereas, uh, say, at La Hinge, there's seven different routes into the green and you can choose based on your skill, based on the wind, et cetera. Partly, yes. Well, I suppose that's the definition of kind of that's, – that's the architectural argument, isn't it? Which of those mm-hmm. is, is the better sort of a golf course design? So maybe just some thoughts on that. But yeah. that notion of sporty, does it make sense to you, the word sporty? When you, do you think of a golf course, oh, that, that, I'd call that a sporty golf course. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know if, if I – I don't know. I don't see go- – It's that's a difficult question for me because I don't – what I'm trying to do with golf and what I think golf can be is like sure sporty, sure a game, sure challenging. But I also see it as like four hours where you can become a better human. And I know that's like so abstract and you're going to hate that I said that. Uh, no, I, funnily but, enough, I don't. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but sp- I understand what you're saying about sporty, but I don't, I don't connect with that word. Okay. Interesting. In the golf, in, in golf. Interesting. Uh, I probably derailed the conversation there unnecessarily. <laughs> do we take it too seriously, Christine, golf? Yeah, totally, totally. We do. and But I think we take the things we should take seriously, not seriously enough. What do we take too seriously and what do we take not seriously enough, I suppose, is the next obvious question there. I think we take numbers too seriously, course ratings, slopes, yardages, pars, stroke play. I think all of that is... Too serious for me. There would have been a time that wouldn't have been the case, though. You imagine you must have been into all of that as a Division One college golfer. That's all. That's your whole world, is it not? It is, yeah. And I'm I'm happy to to leave that behind. Mm. It's understandable how it happens, though, isn't it? One of the hooks of golf, of course, is that first time when you hit a shot that comes out of the middle of the club face and it goes in the air and it looks like a golf shot. In fact, that's probably the addictive thing about golf. It's as addictive for Tiger Woods as it is for all of the rest of us, isn't it? That's the thing that you're pursuing constantly. So it's easy to see how we could get sort of derailed by that, isn't it? Yeah. But but I also think there are – I also think the thing that is addicting about golf is that we're able – it allows us to experience new landscapes and travel and see different type of grasses and meet new people and experience new cultures. I, I think that's what's addictive to golf for a lot of people too. Hmm. I think we're probably addicted to lots of things about golf we don't realise we're addicted to sometimes. We think it's about the making a birdie here or a par there or whatever, but there's actually more to it than that. Yeah, and not to discount that because I'm sure a no. lot of us remember our first birdie and where we were and what course or our and first hole-in-one. Who doesn't want to uh, – your first hole-in-one, you're just rubbing that in for some people, aren't you? <laughs> um, it's a, and who doesn't want to make another one, Christine? It's not to say no, that any of those right. things are not good reasons to be playing golf, but they're, just not, they're not the only reasons in there, perhaps. But they're just very objective ways that we can quantify our experience. And and that's, again, we, we're going back to the same conversation of these these abstract subject, subjective ways that we quantify how we enjoy a golf course are much more difficult to understand and comprehend than just a number on a scorecard. They're not so easy to define, are they? Golf scores are very easy. 73 is better than 74. 68 mm-hmm. is better than 69. That's very simple. No thought required about that. The other things we're talking about are much harder to define. Part of my research, I went around there, I Googled your name and I read a bunch of stuff. There's two that really stand out to me. This is back to that issue I brought up earlier. 
This is from the LPGA Women's Network. Have you ever met – by the way, I didn't find anybody wrote anything bad about you, Christine, so I might have, I might make it a mission of mine to do that, just so there's some balance in the market. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need, we need balance. <laughs> if you ever met Christine Fraser, you'd be surprised to learn that she isn't an art curator for some chic downtown gallery like her cool bohemian vibe suggests. Is that you? Uh, I think it might might be embellished, but I'm I'm okay with that. There's nothing golf about that, I guess, is my point. I read this over and over. Christine Fraser doesn't fit this global golf post. Doesn't fit the mold of a typical participant in the golf course architecture business, and she's okay with that. This it plays into two things: the image golfers have of what golfers look like, and the image that non-golfers have of what golfers do mm. and should look like. And you're kind of breaking the mold on both of those. So. Is that deliberate? Is that welcome attention? Uh, are you a pioneer? Are you shouldering some responsibility that others aren't? I think we spoke about this when we spoke on the podcast. Meg McLaren, who's a professional golfer, has become known as the equal pay girl. And she never meant that to happen. She's written some things and said a few things, and interesting things to consider, and now she's been put in this box and she's the champion of this. You're either with her or against her, whichever side you take. Do you feel any of that? Has this been foist upon you? In a way, I think it has, but it probably was inevitable just because of the industry that I am in. And I, if you ask any other woman who's a superintendent or a golf journalist or a head pro that they might have a similar experience. And I don't know that I, I was I, I was probably naive to think that it wouldn't happen, um, but it has. And I'm OK with that. And and. If I if I'm wanting to tell people to come to the golf course as they are to express themselves through fashion, through music, through language, then then I need to have the confidence and the bravery in myself to do that as well. And that attention that's come with it is that something you feel this gives me a platform I can help to make change, or is it something of? I guess I'm getting to the point of it. You kind of don't get a choice, do you? No, no. No, you don't. And um, here we are and we're doing a podcast and I am so pr privileged to have this platform. And But on the other hand, it's quite daunting and it feels like a big responsibility. And um, I run on like a seven out of 10 fear factor on most days when I'm <laughs> trying to work and do good work. So but that's yeah, it's, you, it's you should, part of the process. You should, shouldn't you? We should all run on seven out of 10 fear factor about the things we do because that's what means that you sort of care about them. At Drum and Golf, we understand your passion. Nice roll. And that's because every Drummond Golf store is owned and run by a local who loves the game as much as you do. Yeah, it's come off the face really well. Someone who knows where you play and what you need. Oh, yeah. Looking good. With Australia's biggest range and expert knowledge. Great. Now let's try that putter with this grip. So if you want to improve your game, see your local expert at Drummond Golf. This is not your first podcast, not your first radio. You've, in fact, perhaps you're one of those... 15 to 20 year overnight success stories would that be fair to say that it's it feels like it's happened very quickly yeah. yeah yeah because it's not just your profile which has grown and you've done one of the reasons i think you keep getting invited on these things is because you're thoughtful and eloquent and articulate and have interesting things to say if you didn't <laughs> that whole would sort of disappear very quickly but of course oh, thanks ron you've got to have the architectural chops to back it up don't you and that's not an mm -hmm. easy craft to learn, and you're sort of learning all that at the same time as well. And you've recently been awarded your first solo lead architect job, and I want you to talk about it, the Toronto Hunt Club. Tell me yeah. about it, and tell me about what this experience has been like so far. A bit like winning golf tournaments. You can't know what this is going to be like until you do it. You can dream about it. You can try to dream up scenarios of how it's going to be. You can't know until you're there. What's it like? What's it been like so far? Yeah, and as you said, uh, up to this point, I've been able to say whatever I want to say <laughs> because I've <laughs> nowhere I need to prove it. Um, so uh, yeah, it was it. I was not ready for the experience. Um, I thought I was. I thought I was prepared. Uh, just in terms of the um, the emotional sort of process that that came with the work that I wanted to do, it 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 was really personal to me. And it's hard to separate myself from getting a job or not getting a job and not taking it personally. Uh, so that was that was a really interesting part of the process. But um, so is pitching for work demeaning in some uh, ways? It's a. <laughs> 
I line up with all the other architects and give my ideas and hope. Like, and I don't mean just for you. I mean for everybody who's involved. This this notion of competitive pitching for work. That's yeah. I think I got to a point where it's like, if I get it, that's great. But if I don't, that's also fine because I can't invest in this more emotionally than I already have because it's starting to affect my mental health. And mm-hmm. um, but I think as as we said, you know, that's that's a a really motivating emotion to experience. Um, and uh, I was up against seven other architects and it was a two month long process and I made it down to the top three. And after thinking, you know, I just got the call to invite, be invited to tender because I was a woman and it would look, you know, good on their, good for their PR. But I started to believe in myself throughout this process and, and really dig my heels in and, and say, you know, I, I actually, I think I can do this. And um, I, when I got the call, it was it was a moment that's really special to me. And and I think looking back on that moment, it will be you know before the Toronto hunt and then after the Toronto hunt. That will be one of those points in my life where there's a before and after. And you don't have you don't get many moments like mm-hmm. that in your life. And golf has given me you know at least three. So I'm so grateful for the for the position that I'm in, and grateful for the Tron to the Toronto Hunt for you know really pushing their their ideas and pushing their membership to open up to a young female architect and and really believe what I have to say. It's a lot to unpack about the decision and everything else, but part of the problem with pitching for work is how much do you need to tell the customer what they want to hear? And how much can you tell the customer what they actually need to hear? That must be a tricky balance. It's really hard. And it's it's um, generally for these things in golf architecture, when you're tendering for a project, there's no, there's no compensation. Um, and so you invest as much time in it that you can, that you think is, is correct. Um, and, and that process is really, as you say, you're trying to find a balance of what you think will get you the job, but also without offending them too much and telling them how much their golf course could be improved <laughs> or whatever it might be. So because there's, there's strategic ways to go around yeah. it of, of, hey, you know, if we put in a forward seat program, um, not because you're misogynistic, <laughs> <laughs> but because uh, there's 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 revenue in that there's extending the life of a golfer Mm -hmm. where people can start playing sooner and continue playing into their senior years longer. So you've just retained a member for an extra 10 years. It's called diplomacy. I think Christine. Is that it? Spin, public relations (laughs) and all those sorts of things. Well, it can be hard because of course, at the end of this process and you're in the midst now of, of doing this work at Toronto Hunt Club. And I want you to tell us some more about it because you should be shouting from the, any architect who gets a solo (laughs) job should be shouting about it from the mountaintops. But at the end of it, it has your name on it. So you have to be happy with that end result. Little journos write stories and they send them off and sub-editors sometimes rewrite them, most times write a headline that doesn't make much sense to the story and then you start <laughs> getting the emails and the phone calls saying that was nonsense what you put in the paper. It's a bit similar to that, isn't it? So you can't just tell people what they want to hear and do what they want to do, what they wanted you to do because no. that's not your role, is it? No, and I think that's what I what I tried to do in this process with the Toronto Hunt is just be so authentic to who I was. Um, because what you're really getting into a long-term partnership mm. in these kind of situations. And, and if you, just like you were, if you were trying to, to get into a relationship with someone, you want to have the same values and you want to be able to push each other in a respective, respectable way. Um, so, so I tried to be as authentic as I could about who I was how I was a bit weird, how my ideas pushed the envelope, how I was going to challenge them. Um, and 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 at the end of the day, it worked out for me, but that's not always the case. And how has it been? What stage are you at with the works there at Toronto Hunt? How's it being received so far? And what, I imagine every day you're learning stuff. You've worked with crews before on doing building and construction, all those sorts of things, but not as the final point of, of 
of responsibility. No, you, the, the buck stops with me. Yeah, that's, that's right. Daunt. I mean, my heart is racing thinking about it. It's such a, it, these are, this is a legacy. This will be, this will be in the archives at the Toronto hunt for a very long time. And I am, I am impacting the experience of a lot of people who play there. Um, and I'm also impacting the experience of the environment that comes out of that golf club and the community around it. So if I think about it too much, it makes you want to pass out a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, the process has been so incredible and the people there are really wonderful and the membership has been so welcoming to me. And the, the most fun I've had is, is going out there and playing golf with the superintendent and, um, getting to know the the women who play in the women's the nine hole women's league and the 18 hole women's league and having a beer with the guys after men's night and just asking people about their experience of the golf course has has given me a really great start on the data collection and the fact finding phase about where we need to go with this and it's been a a collaborative effort between management membership myself the superintendent so it's it's been really wonderful so they have a first draft in hand that sure they've torn up by now. <laughs> Highly unlikely. Much of what you're talking about there is establishing credibility with the customers and not playing golf with the uh, with the members and, you know, all important stuff, isn't it? Because it's very hard. If it's a constantly fractured relationship, if, it, if you're constantly bickering, mm. you can't really get anything done, can you? You cannot get a good result. So before shovel goes in the ground, you need to have that relationship in place. No, especially, I mean, we, I'm working with a committee um, on this project in particular, and it's so important to have the committee involved in the process and, and get on board with the design ideas because they are the one that are going out into the rest of the membership right. to disseminate the process and the ideas. And Everyone smiles at you, Christine, but they tell the committee what they really think. <laughs> exactly. So it's so important to, to make this a collaborative effort that the, you know everyone can be proud of and, and really present in a positive light. Mm. They don't tell you about any of this in the brochure when you decide you want to be a golf course architect, do they? They just show you no. pre pretty exciting golf holes and say, come and do this. Right. <laughs> you know, luckily, my people skills are get me by, but, I mean, we, yeah, this is, does not get talked about, this part of it. The, the, it's, you play politics so much. Because it's got nothing it's to do with golf course architecture, has it? In many ways, like professional golfers who the golf course is their sanctuary once you get to a certain level. So, Thank God I can leave all the rest of the rubbish behind. <laughs> Just play golf. It's, uh, when you finally get out on the golf course, thank God, this is what it, all of that has been about. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's similar experience to me. Yeah. Do you ever wish you'd become an accountant, Christine? <laughs> I'm sure you have your moments. I have my moments. I do, but um, generally, no. I'm 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 really happy with my path. Accountants tell me that numbers don't talk back. That's the joy <laughs> of them. So <laughs> you just make them do what you want to do. So you're here at Toronto. You've had a bunch of influences along the way. Obviously, all architects have. The list of courses where you've had some input and worked through your association with Martin Hawtrey and Jeff Mingay, I'll run through just a couple of them. The Hinch, Dukes, Royal Dublin, Tralee, Dunebeg, Royal Aberdeen and Trump International in Scotland. That would have been interesting, I'm sure. Abington <laughs> Golf Centre, Royal Birkdale and Sunningdale. And there's a whole bunch I've left off. That's a very broad palette of golf. Lots of Lynx golf in there, which many of us would mm. think that's fantastic and important stuff. Non-golfers and a lot of golfers hear that list of names and picture those courses in their minds. And they just see golf courses. What do you see? Uh, to me, I see personalities for each of those courses, which are as different from each other as people are from each other. There's more to a golf course than just a sort of a collection of holes, isn't there? What things do you see there and learn from there that you then take – to maybe try and institute it to run home? That's a stupidly broad question, but does it make some sense about what I'm trying to ask there? Yeah, and like you said, there are different characteristics for each one of those golf courses and, and opportunities there that can be replicated um, in other places. You know, For example, the community around golf courses like La Hinch and St. Andrews and the concept of common land and how it's owned by the community is such an interesting idea that if we can apply that to a municipal golf course in the middle of Toronto, how you know how effective that could be? Can we? We've got the same problem in Sydney. Can we? Can we get there? <laughs> oh, 
we can try. Yeah. <laughs> just keep trying. Yeah. Anyway, um, but, you know, St. Andrews is the coolest municipal golf course in the world. Right. And, and, you know, we can pick pieces of that and bring them elsewhere. Like we can pick pieces of strategy from Stunningdale and bring it elsewhere. And we can pick sustainability from Burkdale and bring it elsewhere. elsewhere. And um, golf courses are so unique and so different. And you can't pick up a whole, th- whole golf course and put it elsewhere, but you can take pieces of it with you. And that's really what I was exposed to when I was with Martin of as many different types and experiences of golf courses that I could. And, and I really settled into what I liked, what I didn't like and, and, and that enabled me to really differentiate myself and create a space for myself in North American golf architecture. What don't you like? It's the it's the more interesting question. (laughs) What don't you like? I didn't particularly um, like walking into Muirfield and having to go through a separate door than Martin. Wow, was there anything? Could you say anything about it at the time? What's the what's the process there for for Christine? No, I well, I perhaps I could have, but I didn't, which makes me feel bad. <laughs> well, I don't know. Can you always? I don't know that you can always. It's not always the best course of action to. No, when you're tra- yeah, it's it's a pretty intimidating environment where you're going in as Martin as Martin's associate and trying to prove yourself and prove that you should be be there and and convince them you have good ideas too. So it's tough. Those issues aside, <laughs> because we've sort of touched on some of those. What about in golf? What are there things? What don't you like about golf? Golf course design and why? I obviously don't like the seventeenth at TPC Sawgrass, <laughs> as you can tell. What things annoy you or do you think don't have a place in golf course design? Um, I don't – I think we give too many of the jobs to the same people. I think that it's not diverse enough. Um, diverse is risky though, isn't it, Christine? No, I don't think diverse is risky. Tom Doak's safe, isn't he? People will pay to pay his sure. golf courses. If you've just spent millions to build a golf course, you want to know that people are going to play it, don't you? There is some – Legitimacy to that too, isn't there? Yeah. Okay. Fair. There's got to be a business case, you know, if a tree falls in a forest and all that sort of stuff. If you build a golf course, it's amazing and nobody ever plays it, um, has that sort of achievement. So I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. But I'm not saying, I'm not saying give someone a job who's never, you know, thought about golf course architecture. I'm saying, um, hire interns, invite people from high schools to start on the grounds crew or to um, watch you build a golf course in their city or to get them interested in, in golf architecture, starting from a lot lower down than from what I think you're talking about uh, and trying to diversify that way and allow golf course architecture to be more accessible to a lot more different types of people. The business of golf gets in the way of many elements of golf, doesn't it? And this is feels like an example of that. It'd be wonderful if everyone could have a go at designing a golf course. <laughs> yeah. It's a very big and expensive thing to do. And yeah. that makes it sort of difficult and awkward. I think you'll enjoy this, Christina. Do you know Bob Harrison? Greg Norman's former associate, Bob. Have you met Bob? Uh, no, no, I don't know Bob. He, lovely, but big bear of a man with a beard, and uh, <laughs> he loved this idea. You've seen that? Uh, it's not, I don't think it's not called US Kids Golf. It's a kids golf program where you hit a Velcro ball um, with the big clubs, and yeah, you know, I think it, the the yeah. last thing they do, the yeah. guy puts on the big suit, and the kids all hit balls at him, tennis balls, and they stick to him, and it's all. So one of the things they do with that program, they go to schools. And let the kids design their own golf course. Awesome. I love that. That's How what I'm much talking about. Would you want to go? And when I told Bob Harrison about that, he was just stunned into silence for a few moments and he said, That would be amazing to watch what kids right. who are unimpacted by, they've had no influence in golf. So, what do mm-hmm. they come up with to make the game interesting to them? Yeah, that's so exciting. You know, have a have a junior clinic, but for architecture. Yeah. So we, yeah. You know, like, oh, that's so cool. Go out on the that. school oval. Here's a bunch of stuff. Make a golf course, but make it interesting and see what they come up with. I think architects could learn a lot from that. We could all probably learn a lot from that, couldn't we? I, I do too. I agree. Yeah. I, and I don't know what – I've never seen what they actually do come up with. The <laughs> Maybe it's rubbish. I don't know. but uh, Take it or leave it. That's kind of what you're but, talking about in a way, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's absolutely what I'm talking about is just getting people more interested and conscious of golf architecture from a young age um, and from a more diverse background. And it, we, you know, we can start really, really small by just asking your playing partner what you liked about that hole and why. I don't know whether it's a human trait. I suspect it is. We've taken the most incredible free form recreational pursuit of all, golf, and constantly tried to narrow it down, haven't we? And tried to shove it into a box. The courses have to be 18 holes. They have to be mm. par 72. They must have four par fives and four par threes. Two of each must be on each nine. These really, when you look at them, really ridiculous rules for a game that it makes no sense to do that. It makes sense no. to have lines in tennis. That just right. makes sense. But it doesn't make sense in golf, does it? Yeah. And, and what I often come up against is if I can present you with two holes that are better than when they started, but you're going to lose a par, that's often, you know, a full stop right there. We, and, and as we talked about, numbers are so real and so tangible and so understandable that we often lose sight of, of what's really important and what's what really makes a golf course a good golf course. Are you familiar with Edwin Rowald from Iceland, the Icelandic architect? Yes, yes, I am. Fabulous website, Why 18 Holes? And he has been trying for years to build golf courses that fit the land he's been given. That's it. And it's just an extraordinarily difficult process. You can't sell anything on a 14-hole golf idea or 16 holes or might be 17 holes, but – Whatever it is, exactly. And and that is – extrapolated on a much larger scale of, you know, if we're changing a whole, how does it affect the slope and the rating? Or, you know, how is that going to affect the overall yardage? Uh, and we just get caught up in these numbers that I think are so overvalued and and limit the potential of, go- of golf. Mm. It's cart before horse, isn't it? That's it. Start with 18 holes and then we make it fit. Yeah, you end up with eighteen mediocre golf holes. Yeah, the the that's right. The 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 numbers are easier. It says that. Whereas really, golf should the golf course design should be about building the best number of golf holes that are going to fit that. Or we could have fourteen fit. exceptional holes. Yeah, it's exactly right. But this is and yeah. this is the crazy thing. And you come up. I imagine you come up against it all the time. You know, you can't have back to back par threes. Well, Cypress Point does. Right, can't the, finish on a par three. Can't finish on a par three. Well, Congressional used to. No longer. They made it the the tenth hole. Yes, these sorts of very limited ideas. Where do you reckon they come from? Is that television? Can we blame professional yeah. golf for that? Yeah, probably. Yeah, they they see Augusta and these types of places that have a very rigid rigid and respected um, way of existing, and and they they want that, and that goes beyond numbers. It goes into the way that we maintain a golf course and the expectations that consumers have about the condition of golf courses. Um, so there's an educational component there that we could all probably learn from. It's a two-way street learning, isn't it? People need to want to learn as well as have the information uh, available. Would Mackenzie roll in his grave if he saw Augusta National today? Many of us have made the statement. I've made it myself. And it's held up as the <laughs> would, would Mackenzie come back? What would he think of Augusta National now? I don't I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't really speculate. I don't know, Mackenzie. On the flip side, if you built Augusta National today, what would the touring professionals say about it? They're all very reverential about Augusta National because it hosts the Masters and always has done. Mm. If Augusta National had never existed and you built it next week and held a tournament there, what yeah. would the touring professionals say about Augusta National, do you reckon? That might fall a bit flat. What did um, I can't remember who the pro was who went to Chambers Bay before the US Open and said, "Oh, this is amazing! Put your coin in the slot and go for, a, you know, go for the stupid That's carnival it. ride." Couldn't yeah. believe that they moved tees around. I thought Chambers Bay was a fascinating the US Open. It was a fascinating um, experiment. It was a real shame. It was the, such the, a study. Yeah. The greens took the, the condition of the greens stole all the limelight from what should have been an incredibly interesting experiment. That. Changing a first hole from a par four to a par five every day and switching that with the eight in that, that was amazing. Absolutely. Shifting tees incredible. 90 degrees on the par threes. And yeah. I mean, I mean, it was worth it just to hear the moaning and the complaining from the pros. <laughs> <laughs> that alone was worth it. But, 
But but that is a much more interesting way to experience golf, is it not, than what we always see, particularly in professional golf, but it seeps into everything. You always play off the same tees every week at your home club. I, we narrow this game and we just we shouldn't. It, it, it doesn't yeah, ruin it, but it's, it's so just- it's so interesting to me how people push so hard against change and variety and spontaneity, which to me is what make makes golf you know, so great. How's Toronto Hunt Club coming along? What is to, tell us a bit of the background of Toronto Hunt Club. I think it's quite a pres- it's a nine hole course, but quite a prestigious course, is it not? If I'm it not is the number one nine hole golf course in Canada. It's very prestigious, um, pretty extensive, interesting history. Um, that uh, it's it's its location is what makes it really unique. It's located on Lake Ontario in Scarborough, and it sits atop a, about a you know, hundred foot bluff overlooking the lake. Nice. So. The, the the location is really really incredible. It's a special place. Um, really involved membership. It's 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 a community that I was welcomed into with open arms, and they have a a pretty big women's contingency of membership. So that excites me, um, and and their involvement with this process. But um, it's uh, yeah, it they they ha- they made golfing history by hiring me. So I hope I hope I. Do a good job. <laughs> that aside, though, you enjoying? You must be enjoying the process. I was, you know, you must sometimes like to drop that whole, you know, woman in a man's world storyline and just think about what it is that you're doing. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, does it? it? Makes no difference. There is nothing about golf course design that makes men or women better suited to do it. There are some no. things in the world you could say that about, but golf course design is not one of them. It's not one. No, no, you're right. And it's a, it's if we're if we're not talking about golf design, it allows me to travel to Toronto every few weeks and go to an art gallery and meet new people and go see a show. And it's it's been you know an incredible experience. Fantastic and a, a fabulous vote of confidence, as you said at the start, and you should be rightly hmm. very proud of that. We'll bring this to a close shortly, Christine. What's the future hold? Christine Fraser, will you finally just get frustrated with the entire crazy world of golf and go and take your talents and we'll be you'll be lost to us, or are you going to stick with it? Retires at thirty five. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you know what? I've um, I've never felt more optimistic about the future of golf than I have this past year, and that's because of people like you and people like the Toronto Hunt and um people on social media who are really pushing the boundaries of what a traditional golfer looks like and what a traditional golf course looks like. So I feel like golf is making, allowing space for a person like me and people like me to, to really make it our own and have find value in what golf can offer our community. So I feel really privileged to be in the position I am. And I'm, I'm thankful that I get to go outside and play in the dirt every day. Has the pandemic had an impact on all that, do you think? I go I go both ways on this question. There's an uptick, obviously, in people playing golf. I feel like we're starting to see that uptick go back down, and we're back to yeah. what we had before the pandemic, which was the reality for golf was it was shrinking and rapidly in terms of participation, people actually taking part in it. Yeah, and what I've – what I've started to understand about the pandemic and what it's offered me in my personal life and also golf in the same capacity is the the way that we lost connectivity with other people during the pandemic. Golf was able to bring that back to us and give that back to us. It was one of the only places, especially in Canada, where we could go out and spend four hours with someone who wasn't in our household bubble. Um, and so it really made evident what golf really can offer you as a person and, and and give you, give, give to your mental health and your physical health and your, and your vulnerability and, and create it. It it really is just an arena for creating meaningful relationships. And so I, I thank the pandemic for really making that easily understandable. I think, and I hope it made a lot of golfers appreciate things about golf that they'd not given much thought to. I hope some mm. of the look downers became look uppers and look outers. Yes. Uh, after the pandemic, because they realised that it was more than just how many Stableford points they had on in the Wednesday <laughs> comp. That it was about much more than that. Mm. Uh, those are the things, and I don't know how we do it either, Christine. But I think we're going to keep plugging away. One thing, I, one problem I think golf has got is because it's kind of so popular. We have our own media and our own language. 
we talk to ourselves a lot. Mm. It's difficult to talk to the pe- to people outside the game, and it's difficult sometimes from within the game to get a gauge on how things might look from the outside. And I don't think a lot of golfers realise just how badly golf is viewed by non-golfers. Yes. Occasionally it bobs up on Twitter when people say, I'll close that golf course and let people walk on it. Golfers are confronted and confused, but golf's a wonderful game. It's not just for rich people. We mm. know all of this sort of stuff. Well, we know it. We need to get the message out. Have you got any thoughts on how we might achieve that, particularly given your celebrity status now? <laughs> That's kind of you to say. Um, do you get any interest from outside of golf? Do magazines want to come and write about you as that woman in a man's world kind of story? Does that happen to you much? No, I haven't had that experience yet. And that's. Uh, I think that's a really good question for me to reflect on going forward is how I can reach outside of golf mm. and invite people into to begin to understand what golf can offer you as a human and 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 offer your relationships. Um, and maybe that's the starting point of like, Hey, you want to just try to invite one person who's never played golf out to play golf once a year, Mm. like start super small, invite them to mini, putt, invite them for dinner at a golf club, because a lot of people don't realize that you can go and have dinner at a municipal golf club, even if you're not a golfer, because as you said, there's a language barrier that we can't, they can't begin to understand and they feel unwelcome. Golf. It's been fantastic to have a chat today, Christine. You've been very generous with your time. I appreciate that. I hope it's not the last time we speak, and uh, I've really enjoyed today. I look forward to speaking again. Thanks, Rod. Well, that was a different take on golf course architecture, I thought, and what an interesting mind Christine has, not only for how golf holes are laid out, but for how the game more broadly might look and feel in years to come. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and that you've made the effort to follow the pod, because on our next, John Huggan sits down with Golf Royalty. The greatest close-up I had of him was at the U.S. Open when it was at uh, Pebble Beach. Mm. Yeah, I was there for that, yeah. And I was... Is that the best golf you've ever seen, do you think? Yeah, I was lucky enough to be a walking observer Mm. on both the third and the fourth rounds for Tiger. Right. But the golf he played was absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. That's Michael Benalek. Next time on The Thing about golf.